Praise God. Thank God for the opportunity one more time, one more time to break bread with us. I pray God that at the end of this session, amen, you know, that we will be blessed. I greet all the pastors, all the visitors, all the saints here with you in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. I mean, I thought hard on the subject tonight because there are many angles you can come from as it relates to the whole subject of discipleship. I mean, it's an area that we have looked at even in our Bible school. We have a course called Evangelism and Discipleship. All right, so I, I, there are many angles that we could have come from in relation to this. But as I prayed, I believe that what we're coming with tonight, praise God, is what I believe God is would have us to hear tonight. Praise God. Let me share my screen. Praise God. Praise God. Amen. So discipleship. We dealt with the whole subject of new convert care. And new convert care really is just a subset or subsection of the whole topic of discipleship. Amen. But a very important one because we have to cater to our young people and babes in Christ. Amen. When I say young people, I mean young in terms of uh, how long they have been saved, you know, babes in Christ. You have people that are older, but they are still babes in Christ. Praise God. So um, tonight we're looking at the subject of discipleship. And we start with the, the scripture. Uh, again, Matthew 28, 19 to 20. I'll read that from the KJV version first. And then I will look at it from the NIV version. So it goes like this. It says, go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them. Um, and by the way, this is Jesus. I mean, after he was, you know, dead, buried and resurrected. Amen. And it was about to be ascended. This was one of, one of his last words that he left with his disciples. Amen. He said, go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. Praise God. And lo, I am with you always. Amen. Even unto the end of, amen. And lo, I'm with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. Praise God. No, the, the NIV puts it this way. It said, therefore, go and make disciples. And why I chose to use the NIV is because of the wording. Amen. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son of the Holy Spirit and teaching them, praise God, to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you to the very end of the ages. Note I've highlighted make disciples. Amen. And I've highlighted baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, or Holy Spirit in this context, and teaching them to, to obey everything I have commanded you. Praise God. So our aim tonight is fourfold. I want to first define who is a disciple. This is very important. Amen. Before we can talk about discipleship, let us try to define who is a disciple. Amen. Then we're going to look at what is discipleship. We look at the attack on discipleship and the core of our presentation tonight is what is required for discipleship program of a church to be successful. What are some of the stuff that we need to do, amen, that would practically, uh, and, in, and in looking at that, we can look at some examples of some of these programs and how they fit, amen, is, as it relates to scripture. So anything that we implement in the house of the Lord, praise God, there is something that we can back it up with scripture to say okay this supports this all right and we're going to be looking at that so our fourfold purpose is who is a disciple and that is based on the fact that jesus did say therefore go and make disciples of all nations all right now normally and when i was growing up when people when you hear about the disciples and even in church there are a lot of people when you ask them about disciples, what comes to mind to them is the 12 disciples of Jesus Christ. Amen. And, and a lot of times we, we kind of get that wrong because we get the impression that a disciple, when the Bible talk about a disciple, it was speaking specifically about the 12. But if you can remember scriptures carefully, there were 
even instances where there were much more than 12. Remember, there were about 70 that followed him. And then out of the 70, there were 12 and so on. So, but we want to look at what the true definition of a disciple is based on how it is used in Matthew 28, verse 19. And we want to ensure that at the end of the day, amen, we get a good definition um, in terms of how to, to look at this word disciple in scripture. So the word disciple in Matthew 20, 19, it comes from a Greek word, mathatheo. But the Bible says, go and make disciples. That word is mathatheo. And it actually means to be a disciple of one. And we spoke about this last week where we said that when you become a disciple, it is twofold. One, you become a disciple of one. That means to follow his precepts and instructions. In other words, you are the one following somebody else. Praise God, you are a disciple. But also, you are also a disciple in the sense that you, it means to make disciples, to teach or to instruct. So in the house of the Lord, you are, you are there's always twofold to how uh, we look at the whole context of a disciple it is one somebody who actually uh follow somebody else so i'm a disciple of the lord jesus christ because i follow the lord jesus christ but i'm also a disciple in a sense of of who uh is ahead of me my my my, my the ministers and the, the, the pastors or whoever god has set above the angel of the church amen and i follow him as he follows christ right so to be a disciple of one, to follow his precepts and instructions, right? Secondly, to make a disciple. So apart from the fact that you are following someone else as they follow Christ, you have somebody else who is going to eventually follow you. Amen. And that's why it's very important that, amen, we uh, have some things in place in our very lives because what we'll do, we will produce after our own kind. All right. But the word Martha Theo is a little deeper than just becoming a disciple of one or to make a disciple it's a little deeper so if you look at it in the greek it speaks to following with an aim to conform so a lot of times when we talk about discipleship we think about uh following but it, it is more than just following it, there is a progress or a journey in the process so um, you are following Jesus with the aim to be like Jesus. All right. So that is that 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 is the ultimate uh, what disciple is. He follows Christ with the aim of becoming like Christ. So being a disciple is all about a journey. It's a, it's a, it's a journey of total transformation. All right. So therefore, a lot of us need to check our lives then if we are really disciples, because truth be told, discipleship starts from one learning about Jesus. And, and this is what we do. The process of discipleship actually starts, didn't start at the time when you when you uh, begot, got saved. The process of discipleship started at the point where you were called. I mean, when, when Jesus went out, for example, and he said, follow me. And we'll talk about that later on. I mean, that's the point where when you, when, when you are called, that's where the process started. All right. So you're learning about Jesus and you learn about Jesus through the whole process of evangelism. Somebody uh, through probably personal evangelism spoke to you. Somebody probably you're in a 10 crusade to uh, mass evangelism and somebody preached to you, whatever the context is. But it started with a process of learning about Jesus. Does it stop there? It moves on to a second part of the journey with a view of following Jesus. So now, after that you have learned and, and somebody has preached the gospel to you and you are pricked in your heart, like the Bible said in Acts chapter 2, verse 37, when they heard the word of Peter, they were pricked in their hearts and they said unto Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? And Peter gave them more information and instruction. So the view now is not just to hear, but now to follow. And therefore, that is where the salvation process comes in. So evangelism, and the year becomes saved. And then then it becomes, then there's a third part of it where you continue now to move from just the, 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 this point A and you're reaching to the point where you actually become like Jesus. That is a sanctification process where God works on your behalf. God works on your heart, praise God. And eventually, and day by day, amen, you grow, as the Bible says, in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. So based on the Greek and based on the definition in the Greek of a disciple, evangelism does not come before discipleship. 
all right? But it is the beginning of discipleship. And a lot of times we, we get the impression that discipleship uh, begins after the cross. And when I say after the cross, it begins after you have become saved. No, discipleship starts at the point of evangelism, all right? It's just that how we, we normally look at it and I understand the context in how we use it. But if we're going to go back to the whole uh, scripture, we're going to be fully scripture based in how we look at the whole subject of discipleship. You're going to realize that based on its Greek uh, the Greek word that is used for it, evangelism, does not come before discipleship. Praise God. It is the beginning of discipleship. All right. So I want us to get that clearly. Discipleship, being a disciple, is one who first learns about Jesus Christ through evangelism, then with a view to follow Jesus, which is salvation, and then to become more like Jesus day by day, which is God sanctifying us, sanctification. All right. And, and we look more at it. But that practically, will be the, the working definition that we will work with even as we teach this particular subject going forward, all right? So we are learning about Jesus with the view to follow Jesus and then to become more like Jesus. We gave a, de a definition also for discipleship. So now we define disciple, but we're going now to discipleship, which is the practically the whole process now that the church would have done uh, to the scene. So discipleship, we said, defined as the conservation. Tonight, we're taking a little step further and we're going to define what these things are. So conservation is the act of trying to protect or preserve something. Amen. So that is the first uh, thing when we talk about discipleship. We are trying to conserve, we are trying to protect, we are trying to preserve something. All right. So for example, um, we know when somebody gets saved, um, there, there's a great uh, if certain things are not put in place, amen, to keep them, amen, then 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 eventually will they will weary, they will they will be out of the house of God. In a similar way, like you would put, you get meat and you want to preserve it, you put it in the fridge. The environment plays a very big role in terms of uh, conservation and protecting and preserving the saints. So discipleship is the conservation. Two is the maturation, which is the process of becoming mature. So apart from the fact that you want to preserve uh, the, the saints of the Most High God, preserve the people of God, we want also them to mature. Amen. Uh, somebody who, it, it is ridiculous in the natural for somebody who is 25, praise God, unless they have some form of sickness or something, to be still wearing diaper or to be still uh there are certain things that is not going to look right to us if a person is of a certain age and they're and they're not operating at that age so for example we would say that this a child we can look at a child and we can determine that this child has a problem down syndrome or something based on how they behave or there's something that is not right all right because we know that the, 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 there should be a gradual increase maturity as time goes by in the in the lives in the physical life of individual can i tell you the same apply in the church of the most high god we understand when a new convert does something amen but when somebody that is in the house of god for 20 years 30 years amen behaves a particular way or reacts a particular way it speaks volume of where is this person where is the maturity because as, as the, the whole uh, idea of discipleship is one to conserve, two to mature, to bring it to a state of maturity. So as they as they are in the house of God for a period of time, they should the process should be that they are growing in grace and they are growing in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. But discipleship also in its definition speaks to multiplication. Is the act of our process of multiplying. Amen. Or making. Uh, so, for example, it's it, it, Jesus, I said it last week, Jesus cursed the tree because it should have been producing, amen, and it didn't. And Jesus was upset with it. So he cursed the tree and it immediately it dried up. I realize that Jesus expect of us as disciples that we should multiply. Amen. If you're in the house of the Lord, amen, and you're not multiplying both in your own life and both in carrying saints into the house of the Lord, then you need to check. Because apart from the fact that you're you're in the house, you're protected, you're preserved, apart from the fact that you should be growing, there should be also the step of multiplying. That's discipleship. So discipleship 
should aim to get the child of God to a place where they are conserved, where they mature, and when their main aim is to multiply and produce after their own kind. And Jesus uh, did a powerful teaching in St. John chapter 15, verse 1 to 8. And I want us to, to look at the scripture here tonight. He said, look here, he said, I am the vine and, he, and my father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that bear not fruit, he take it away. And every branch that bear fruit, he purge it that it may bring forth more fruit. Now you are clean through the word which has spoken unto me. Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot be a fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine, no more can he except he abide in me. I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. I'm going to say, if a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch and is withered. And men gather them and cast them into the fire and they are burnt. He said, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, you shall ask what you will and it shall be done unto you. Herein is my gl father glorified that you be a fool. And he says, so shall ye be my disciples. So we talk about discipleship. Jesus described clearly some things that are required of the disciple. First of all, he described himself that he is the true vine. So the whole process of discipleship begins with Jesus, starts with him. He is the true vine. Amen. Anything that we're going to do in the house of the Lord begins with him. He said, look here, if you're in a part of this, every branch in me that don't be a fruit, he'll take it away. So eventually, if you're not bearing fruit, you need to check yourself. Because God is saying, if you don't be a fruit, he's going to take away. But if you do be a fruit, he's going to purge you. In other words, he's going to prune you. He's going, to, he's going to cut off the little things in your life that need to go up. And the little places, there are some things, uh, when, they, when they prune the vine, they remove the, the bad things and the little bad edges. And they, they make sure that they, they, it gets in water and it gets in sunlight. And that's what they, the vine keeper would have done. In a similar way, there are things that God will bring in our lives. Amen. That would enable us to be purged that we might bring forth more fruit. And he said, No, no team apply. No, you are clean to the word which I've spoken unto you. In other words, what he uses to purge you, what he uses to cleanse you and to and to bring you to a place is through the word. I'm saying abide in me, and, and as the branch cannot be a fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine. In other words, we can be maturing. We cannot be multiplying unless we really are abiding in the vine. Amen. No more can you accept you abiding in me. I am the vine. Ye are the branches. He that abides in me and I in him, the same bring it forth much fruit. So again, we need to check ourselves. If we are not producing, if we're not building fruit. And funny thing about this scripture is that it is twofold. The, the fruit here speaks to the fruit in your individual life. That's one interpretation. It means that as a child of God, you're supposed to grow. You're supposed to mature. You're supposed to move from strength to strength in him. Amen. But it also speaks to the fruit in the sense that you are producing. Amen. You are bringing in new converts. You are witnessing to others. Your life is speaking volume to others. Amen. And you're building others because guess what? You abide in him. And guess why you're good at that? Because without him, you can do nothing. And then he made a very powerful statement. He said, if a man abide not in me, is cast forth as a branch and is withered, and men gather them and cast them into the fire and they are burnt. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you shall ask what you will and it shall be done unto you. Here is my father glorified, that what? That he bear much fruit. So shall he be my disciples. I like that statement. So Jesus here is defining through an example of the branch who the disciple is. The disciple is somebody who God prunes. The disciple is somebody who is cleansed by the word. The disciple is somebody who produces fruit. And this is very important in the whole scheme of evangelism, even though our discipleship, even though we are, we are we're going to look at it from the perspective of the church, I want us to take it individually too and realize that we have a very important role to play in the whole era of discipleship. While we are being discipled, we have to be, uh, we are, we, we, while we are being discipled by somebody else, we have to be ensure that we, we are producing people also that will eventually follow us. So based on what we are saying then, discipleship is, 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 is 
is what is we are saying to have the allow the Holy Spirit and the word to renew their minds. That's just based on what we just read in the scripture and transform their heart. That's conservation. So the Holy Spirit and the word renew your mind, transform your heart. And you have maturation has become personal representative of Jesus Christ. That's maturing your life. When people look at you, they're seeing Christ. And that is why in the church, when we talk about a discipleship program, whatever we're doing, we are producing people that are, be that are becoming mature to the point where people can look at them and they can see Christ in them. To whom he continues his redemptive assignment in the earth realm. That is multiplication. Not only will people see Christ in you, but they'll be led to also follow you you know that there are some people in the house of the lord and, and all of us can attest to this amen there are some people uh that even though pastor is pastor amen there are some people in the house of god that is only some people can reach them based on their personality like i, I, I i've seen it you mean you have a big brother you have a big sister and you're so close to that one because that's the whole process of of discipleship you are discipling somebody. There are some people in the world that probably only you alone can reach. And it's based on how you talk, based on how you, you, you carry yourself, based on how all of these things. And people look for that. And they realize that through this person, based on their lifestyle, based on what they see in them, they can pull others and create multiplication. You have to play your role in doing this. But while we talk about the whole thing about discipleship, before we go into how the church is going to apply some of these things and what we can do, we must understand that there is an attack and this, the devil will never sit back and allow us to, to bring up people and preserve them and mature them and, 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 and allow them to multiply. So we have to be realized as children of God, uh, the pastors especially have to have this eye out Amen. On the attack that, are, that is coming to the house of God. They have to have this eye out that look here. There is a Sambalat and Tupaya who is going to attack the body. Amen. There is some people who are going to create discouragement and discord. So let's just look at three attacks that we can find. Uh, and this is what the pastor will look out for in relation to, to ensure that the program he's planning to instill amen, in the house of God is kept properly. So the first one is the whole thing about false preachers and teachers. Very important. So the Bible teaches some things about the what false teachers can do and what and what they have done. For example, in Matthew chapter 24, amen. The, the Bible clearly tells you that you will have some people coming into the house of God, amen, who will try to destroy the thing and their main concern is not to feed the flock their main concern is to is to destroy and to mess up something that is good that is why i i know for sure that some pastors and, and i know it specifically in relation to bishop not any anybody is probably going to come around and, and and preach not because you're a good preacher not because you're a good teacher because we have to be very careful of who we place in the pulpit let's be careful as who we used to teach because guess what at the end of the day amen the bible talk about this in jude chapter one and verse four for there are many for there are certain men crept in unawares who are before of all ordained to this condemnation and godly men turning the grace of our god into what lasciviousness and denying the only lord god and our lord jesus christ now here it is that jude the half brother of jesus christ was right about to write a letter uh, about the common salvation according to what the scripture was saying but there was a more pressing matter that came up right along the way and he had to deal with that and what was he dealing with false teachers very important that we realize that False teachers will want to come into the house of God and they will want to mess up uh, the things of God. Amen. So Paul said to Timothy, if any man teach otherwise for, and consent not to the wholesome word, even in the words of our Lord Jesus Christ and to the doctrine which is according to godliness. I'm going to say he is proud, knowing nothing but doting about questions and strives of words. We have commit envy. So he's telling you, the, the product of what will happen if we allow these false teachers, amen, to come into the house of God, amen, and to and to this and to mess up things. So as we relate to discipleship and having a good discipleship program, we have to be very cognizant and, and very alert about who we will use 
to preach and to teach. Amen. Because what they produce is envy and strife and railing and evil. So all of these things come in. I, I don't know if you have ever had a situation where you have to do a whole heap of uh, con damage control. You have to try to say, God, how oh, we fix this one? Amen. Because a lot of issues rise up and come in by just allowing the wrong person to be at the wrong place and, and, and to bring something that, boy, God, what am I going to do now? Amen. False teachers, false preachers. But guess what, brethren? As I'm happy that we have somebody that is looking and ensuring. You know, there was a church in the book of Revelation, praise God, where the Bible talk about they allow this woman called Jezebel, amen, to teach and to preach. And, 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 and the Bible talk about her. And guess what she do? She, the Bible caused the, 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 the saints to even commit fornication. Amen. And fornication, there can be in a spiritual sense. One of the things that she was doing, she was teaching people based on the fact that they could have got to these guilds and they could have, have sexual. I said, nothing wrong with that, man. You can't do that. That's part of your job. It's just a part of what you're doing. False teaching and false preaching. So we have to be careful in our uh, discipleship program. Amen. Whatever we are implementing to grow people, to mature people. Amen. So allow them to multiply. Because that's another thing too. Multiplication sometimes will come, but multiplication of what? We want to ensure that when people are solid and whosoever we put to teach are people who are solid, people who preach are people who are solid. Amen. And therefore, at the end of the day, whatever is imparted in the body, amen, is will, 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 will produce people who also will become mature. Another attack is false doctrine. I personally have seen where false doctrine, if not left unchecked, praise God, will, will be like a cancer. Amen. It, 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 it is so terrible. And, and why it is a problem? Because it doesn't just attack the new converts. A lot of people will think it's just the new converts is being troubled. No. When, when they start introduce the whole thing of false teaching, when people don't rightly divide the word of truth, when they don't have people who are studying to show themselves approved unto God, people who are in the word and can dissect the word and can what we call exegete the word and get the true meaning out of the word, you realize that what will happen if we have a lot of chaos in the body. They will have to have problems in the body. Amen. Because somebody going to teach something that they feel. Gone are the days where people accept uh, any and anything still. But at the same time, people want word. People people sometimes tired of the jumping and the skipping. They want solid word. They want true word. Praise God. So this is in this season, we need some people who are coming with the word of God. Amen. So the Bible talk about Galatians chapter 1. Praise God from verse one so I'm 69 said so I marvel and that is showing the problem with false teaching because here it is that the church at Galatia amen was a powerful church Paul was the one who won them but you had a set of people who came in who were called Judaizers and these guys decided that look here you have to and I remember teaching this also you have to uh follow the laws of Moses to be saved you had to be circumcised to be saved false teaching you know sound good because these were these were Jewish Christians, praise God, who decided that they don't want to let go of a Judaism and they wanted to hold on to do all things. And Paul of man, I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ and to another gospel. So the new our discipleship program have to be realize that there can be an attack of uh, that that's why whoever would put to lead Sunday school, whoever would, would put to be in charge of this and charge of that should be people who are trained, people who love the word, people who want to be a, who are a, who are willing to submit themselves to leadership. Because that's another problem. Judah had to deal with that. We talk about people who who come into the house of God and, and they speak ill of dignitaries. Praise God. I'm going to say that even Michael, uh, that's the devil create a real accusation against, uh, ag well, Michael never really a real accusation against the devil, but he said, the Lord rebuke you. In other words, you must have to say, Michael was at the author at the place where he could have probably de talk high and disrespectful of the devil, but to show that the man was respectful or the angel was respectful and understand the whole issue of rank, because that's important, you know. In the angelic world, you have ranks, you have ranks. And therefore, what, what, what Jude was saying is that, look here, dignitaries in the realm of in geology, if you study in geology, you realize that there are different ranks, principalities and powers and rulers. These are ranks in, uh, in, in, in geology. And therefore, Michael understood who the devil was, even though he was 
had fallen angel. He was a cherub, a choice cherub. So at the end of the day, he said, he didn't appeal to him own authority, but he appealed to authority higher than himself. And he said, the Lord rebuke you. But in the body now, you have some really people coming with some things, praise God, and they want to speak ill, amen, of dignitary and pastors, and they will say anything that comes to their mouth. That the pastor, that, that, you have to be very careful, brethren, in terms of how, and that is why they, they, this, these are the attack that come on discipleship, because these things are slowly fostering into the body of Christ. Where people just open them out nowadays and say anything about anybody without no concern. But God, 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 God is our witness that He's going to be dealing with these things. Another thing that another attack on biblical discipleship is on godly fellowship. Amen. So as, as pastors and leaders, we have to look out for ungodly fellowship. You know, the Bible tells you a couple of tough, you know, the Bible says, make no friendship with a man given to anger. My God. That is in Proverbs 22, 24. So when you when in your discipleship program, when you're teaching the, 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 the saints, let them understand that who they can keep friends with. Somebody said, look here, but but you have friends and you have friends. I always tell people that you have friends and you have friends and you have friends. And that's what I mean. In the sense that it's not everybody you can you can hook up with. Amen. Two can walk together, except they be agreed. So at the end of the day, if your friends are people who are not living for God, eventually what is going to happen is that you are going to be drawn that way. Amen. You have to ensure that your, your, your friendship is, is people who love God. So the discipleship uh, program, our discipleship principles in the house of God must teach people that you must not make friends with people who are angry or don't, the most Bible said, be no company with a man that is called a fornicator or called vicious and idolater. And note the term, the man that is called a fornicator. Not the man that commit fornication one time. You're not gonna, you're not gonna rub him because you have people who have fell. And truth be told, you have people who have fell, but it doesn't mean that that person is a fornicator. A fornicator in this, uh, the Greek here means, it's, it's in the continuous tense, meaning that person continues to live that type of lifestyle. All right, I just want to make that clear. Next thing you go here, say, okay, this brother did something 10 years ago, and you have him off, he's a fan. No, that's not who a fornicator is. A fornicator is somebody who continues to live that particular way, right? So it, it, there's some attack on biblical discipleship. And that is what false teachers and preachers, we can't go more in depth with that, false doctrine and ungodly fellowship. Now, in getting that now, let us move into, uh, well, let's, let's look at the scripture first. Because we spoke about this one in terms of false teachers and preachers. So let's just look at that scripture. Who then is a faithful and wise servant, whom his Lord had made ruler over his household, to give them meat in due season? So he's talking about uh, the, the good servant. What he's going to do in his house is going to give them good meat in due season. Blessed is that servant whom his Lord, whom he comes, shall find so doing. So the pastor is cognizant of, of who the person who is, who is going to feed the house with good meat in due season. Verily I say unto you that he shall make him ruler over all his goods. But if a man that is evil servant shall say in his heart, my Lord delays coming and shall begin to smite his fellow servants and to eat and to drink with the drunken, the Lord of his servant shall come in that day when he looketh not for him. And in our that he is not aware of, and shall cut him asunder, and appoint him his portion with the hypocrites. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So he's describing two set of person: one who is faithful in the house, one that ensure that the house is, is blessed and they get the right meat in due season, as opposed to another man who come there and all him do is preach from gain. All him do is, and trust me, there, there's a thing I've learned. It is more than just preaching and teaching. What is imparted are many times when people go around the pulpit and teach is more than just the words that they say. What is imparted is the spirit that they come with. And that is why it's important that as even as ministers, we 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 try the spirit. Also, we pray. I would say, God, this person is going to come around the pulpit. I don't know him very well. Amen. But God ensure that whatever spirit is imparted, praise God, is of God. Amen. I'll give you a good example. In, in Acts chapter 16, the Bible said this girl with the spirit of divination followed Paul day and night. And she said, These men are the men of the Lord, which show us the way of the Lord. There's nothing she said that was wrong. Nothing she said that was out of place. As a matter of fact, what she practically said was the truth. She speak the truth, but there was a spirit that was connected to her. And therefore, Paul had to deal with the spirit. So it's, it's more than we talk about 
giving meat in due season, blesses that servant, whatever. There are some people who will come and they will sound like they're doing the right thing and they look like they're doing the right thing, but the spirit has been imparted. Amen. But I pray, God, that as leaders, amen, we'll be cognizant and we'll be, we'll be alert and we'll be praying to ensure that when people come, amen, they don't come with bad meat that tastes good. Amen. There are some things that look good, you know, amen, and even taste good, but it's not necessarily good for you. Praise God. And that's what we want. Now, if the church is going to be successful in a discipleship program, so now we take it from just the individual now, but we're moving it now to what the church needs to do. Amen. We're talking about implementing proper discipleship program so we can grow the saints from a state of, of just, just being saved. We want to ensure that we keep them. We want to ensure that at the end of the day, they, they, they mature and at the end of the day, they multiply. And these were the three main things we spoke about from last week, which is really what discipleship is. All right. So for the church to have a successful discipleship program, it is important that these three things are taken care of. This is what came to mind. And I'm thinking that, I mean, there could be other things. There are other things I could have taken down. But as I prayed, this is what I feel led to look at. One, I thought about Jesus Christ and I said he must have implemented a model for who disciples should be like. And therefore, if he himself, who is the master, the king of kings, amen, decided that this is what a disciple is supposed to do, this is what a disciple is supposed to look like, I believe that whenever we have our discipleship programs, and the discipleship programs mean however, whatever we do in the body of Christ to ensure that we preserve and we mature and we grow the people, we must implement the same way Jesus did it. So we must be, the, the program must be after the model Jesus himself implemented. He is the master discipler. He know how to get people in. Amen. He just walked up to people and said, follow me. And they followed him. Amen. But at the same time, he did some things that, at the, at, 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 that shows you that he was serious. He never just want people not follow him, but he wanted people who are serious about the thing. So there are three things we can look at tonight. One, you must be after the model Jesus implemented. Two, it must be based on sound biblical teaching. So if you're going to implement a discipleship program, where in the scripture can you model something like this? Amen. And, 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 and you might not have the same name, amen, but the, the principle that we find in scripture must be the same. And th thirdly, it must cater, your discipleship program must cater to the whole man. Very, very important. The whole man. So first of all, let us look at Jesus' model of discipleship. Now, Jesus had a model for how he, he brought people in. As he taught his disciples, he expressed clearly what will be required of them. Amen. It's important that whenever we go out and we evangelize and we win souls and people come into the house of God, they must understand what is required of them as children of God. Jesus never means word. Jesus never go around the boat. Jesus clearly told them what was needed for them uh, to, to, to become his disciples. He actually tell you, if you do this, then you are my disciples. If you don't do this, you are not my disciple, clearly. In a similar way, saints must be fully aware of what the scripture teaches, praise God, in relation to who a disciple is. Amen. The saints must know exactly who a disciple is. All right? So let us look at Jesus' model of discipleship. And look at how Jesus dealt with the whole subject of discipleship. All right. First of all, Jesus, Jesus said, follow me. Amen. And the Bible said in, in, in Matthew 4, 19, and he said unto them, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. So Jesus was practically walking by the Sea of Galilee. And we know he saw two brothers, Simon and Peter and Andrew, his brother, the Bible talker, and the Bible said they were casting net into the sea. And they were fishermen. And he said unto them, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. And the Bible said they immediately left their nets and followed him. And going there, he saw two other brothers, James, the sons of Zebedee, and John, his brother, in the boat with Zebedee, his father, mending their nets. And he called them and immediately they left the boat and their father and followed him. Now, the first thing is that we need to tell people that, look, here, when you come to God, you know who you're following. We are not, we are, we, we even though, the, at the end of the ultimate person who you're going to follow is Jesus Christ himself. So Jesus said to them, follow me. Same thing. You must follow the Lord. And, and, and this is very important because sometimes we, what we try to do is 
I know we have our own stands and stuff, and I know we have our own uh, views and stuff, but the ultimate aim of getting disciples, of discipleship program, is to get people to model. I must say earlier in my definition, it's purpose to become like Jesus Christ himself. Amen? And Jesus said, look here, apart from the fact that you're going to follow me, Jesus never means the words about what is required when you follow him. So he said in Matthew 16, 24, then Jesus said to his disciples, if any man will come after me, let him, let him. So Jesus, now after telling disciples to follow him, he told them what was required to, of them to do after they started to follow him. He never tried for it. If we, if we go around the, the boat and say, okay, more than 5,000 men to follow me or 10. No, he told them exactly what is needed. Then said Jesus unto his disciples, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. In other words, what the church need to model is that in our discipleship program, we need to tell people these things too. If you're going to become a Christian, you need to, if any man will become a Christian, you need to come after Jesus deny yourself take up your cross and follow me now we can break this down amen into into sections and look at what exactly jesus was actually saying to the disciples are people who decided to follow him first of all himself any man in other words in no matter who you are if you are the pastor if you are the the least of the saints every person who comes into the house of god any person, what the first thing they need to do, they need to come after me. Now, it's that term, come after me in the Greek. It speaks to more than just coming or walking behind Jesus Christ. But it speaks to a desire to go after him. In other words, it's more than just walking, but you have the desire. You want to, you want to pursue Jesus. It involves pursuing Jesus and emulating him in every area of your life. Your thoughts, your words, and your deeds. So if any man will come after me, let him will come after me. In other words, if any man will desire me, if any man will desire to come after me. So that's the first step. When we're telling people about this whole thing about um discipleship and whatever program we, we implement, praise God, it has to let them know that, look here, you're, who you're following is Jesus Christ. Who you're going to have the desire to follow is Jesus Christ. And it must be in all areas of your life. Your, your, your following must be the way you, you want to think that Jesus thinks. You want to, the words that Jesus would do, the, way, the deeds that Jesus would do in a similar way. Amen. And can I tell you something? It is not a easy task at times. It might sound easy, but and let me give you an example of something. I saw something recently and it shows you the heart of men. I don't know if, if, if any person here have, have um, heard about what happened in uh, one of the Jamaica Zoo thing where this, this, this man pushed his finger into the, 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 the mouth of, of some lion and the, the lion practically bite off his finger, right? Or something to that. So I read something like that. But what I also saw were the comments. And, I, and I'm saying to myself, boy, you know, say, we're really rough with how we deal with each other. It shows lack of love. And somebody said, I'm foolish, whatever the case. And if you think about it carefully, I'm not saying the action he did was was wise. It was a silly movement to put your hand in the, in the, in the, in the, in the mouth of a lion. The man is now down. And people say, watch him. He should have put him all hand. He should have lose him all hand. He should do this. Him should, they, 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 all kind of negative things. And I look at about them and say, look, you know, the heart of men is cold because you are speaking because you are not in that position. And what we are lacking is love. In a similar way, when a brother or a saint goes down, amen. It, it, when I say when follow Jesus in terms of words and deeds and thought, have you ever thought about some things that you have done in your life? So, but Jesus was supposed to look back and say, boy, you know what? You're supposed to just dead. Me, me, me done with you. Me wipe you off. A lot of us, with our, and because all of us have made some stupid mistakes and have done some really ridiculous things. But if we are supposed to emulate Jesus in terms of deeds and words, some of these things would never come to our hearts. And sometimes we need to check ourselves to see if we really have love that we should have. I think in this time, uh, what we are lacking is love. But guess what? Discipleship would teach us that, look, when we are pursuing Jesus, our desire to pursue Jesus, we should emulate him the same way that he would show love and deeds and, and all of these things should be a part of our lives. Amen. Jesus wants to say that, let him deny himself. So apart from the fact that you're following Jesus, you have to deny yourself. This speaks to self-denial. It is 
not possible for one to be a true disciple of Jesus and still be in control of their own life. In other words, when you truly desire Jesus, in other words, Jesus becomes fully control of everything that you do. Amen. You fully deny yourself. And that is the aim where we should go. God, discipleship program should lead us to a point where we realize that who is in charge? Jesus Christ himself. A true disciple would want Jesus to be fully control of your life. Disciples of necessity, one whose will is wholly submitted to the will of God. In other words, when you become a disciple, everything about you is submitted to the will of God. Jesus said, take up your cross. Discipleship involves the conscious decision to identify with the cross of Jesus Christ. And can I tell you something? The cross is not a pretty piece of furniture. It's an ultimate symbol of rejection, pain, and suffering. And we're going to talk about that. So the discipleship program, we should tell people as it is. Look here, when you become a child of God, it's not going to be easy all the time. You're going to have rejection. You're going to have pain. You're going to have suffering. Because guess what? You're taking up your cross and follow me. It's an invitation to follow Jesus right up to Golgotha, the place of a skull. Amen. It's an invitation to die with him so that he may live in and through you. What am I saying? Whatever program we imp implement should teach people about what Jesus taught about discipleship. It was Paul who said in Galatians 2.20, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh I live by faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So it's an invitation to be crucified with Christ. But God forbid that I should glory, save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the whole world is crucified unto me and I unto the world. Here Paul writing in these two scriptures in Galatians, talking about what uh, follow me means. Follow me means, look here, you're following Christ to the point where you are crucified with him. Your life is totally in submission to him. Now, Jesus defined who can be his disciples. And this is another thing. Jesus said, if any man will come after me and hate not his own father and mother and wife and children and brethren and sister, yeah, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. We're talking about discipleship. Amen. If we're talking about being Christ's disciple, it means that, and it's not saying that he was hate your mother, you know, and not saying he was hate your wife or your children. Get the context. What Jesus is saying is that when you compare the love that you should have and the reverence and the respect and all of these things that you should have for Christ and where you want to follow him, when you compare that with the love that you have for your father and your mother and your wife and your children and your brethren and your sister, it, it is so, the gap is so wide that you probably think it's hate. In other words, you love God so much, amen, that everything else will, 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 will practically fade in comparison to the love that you have for him. And Jesus said, whosoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Again, he's telling you who the disciple is, somebody who will follow him and bear their cross. Jesus actually also told in his model of who a disciple is supposed to be. Nobody was ever forced, but he told them to count the cost. When we're having our discipleship program, we have to tell people that there is a cost to follow in Christ. We can't, you know, a, a, a lot of people come into the house of God and a lot of saints, and they get the impression that everything is going to be dandy all the time. But look at this. From that time, many of the disciples went back and walked no more with him. This is Jesus, you know. Then said Jesus unto the twelve, will he also go away? Then Peter said, answer him, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou has the word of eternal life. When Jesus preached a message and it was hard for them. There's some stuff that's going to be taught. You have to tell them, my understand discipleship, which is to keep people, but you have to, you can never force people to remain in the house of God. You have, if, if you if you do that, what you're going to create are saints who are not solid. You have to tell people that when you follow Jesus Christ, you, just like what you say, you have to eat my flesh and drink my blood. Amen. So like a hard saying, at the end of the day, the disciple. People look on and not understanding what, what he meant. Amen. So no for them decided them they, from that day, the disciples said, we now walk with him again. They going to come some things where they tell people to live right and to live holy. They might decide so we can't be in a church no more. But you can't force them because discipleship have to be to the have to be true. This was the model Jesus said, Jesus put forward. But Jesus asked the other 12 now, will you also go? In other words, it confirms what I said earlier. It has to be a desire that the person has. And you have to tell the persons clearly as they, based on Jesus' model, that this is what is required of you as a child of God. As a child of God, uh, 
and note, you know, you're dealing with people at different stages in their lives, but at the same time, as they get older, they need to count the cost of what it takes to become a Christian. So Jesus said, look here, man, if you're going to follow me, you have to count the cost. There is a cost to following me. There is a cost, and you have to tell people this, there is a cost to following Jesus Christ. In our discipleship program, we have to make people understand that, look here, as you build in the house of the Lord, amen, there is a cost to do it. And, 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 and Jesus requires that, look here, you understand that there's a cost to this. Now, what is the cost? Let me give you some example of what the cost. You know, a lot of people say, boy, we come to the house of God, I'm going to get married. We need to, when we preach it and teach it, look at, not everybody going to get married. I let them understand that. Not everybody going to be rich. Let them understand that. As a matter of fact, one of the scriptures I've always heard people quote is Matthew 6.33. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. Out of context. Because the, all these things there, you have to go back verses above. 31 and 32. Therefore, do not worry saying, what shall he eat? What shall he drink? And what shall you wear? In other words, when him say all these things, what's him talking about? As long as you're a child of God, God is going to provide for you because we ensure you eat. God will ensure you drink, and God will ensure so you have house. You have, you have clothes to wear. You know, to mention housing. After all this, it's a gentile see, but you're heavily following know what things you have need of, that you have need of all these things. Name you say, you know, say, I'm going to give you a husband, I'm going to give you a wife, and you're going to be rich. No. But we have to tell people as it is, as they become saints of the most high God, look here. This is a journey, and this journey means that at the end of the day, God will provide some things, but some things not going to happen. Not everybody going married. But guess what happened? There is a prize ahead. You can tell them this. And let them know that, look here, whatever you lose in this life, amen, you, whatever you go through, the light afflictions, which is for a moment, working for us a far more exceeding weight of glory. There are some things ahead of you that God promised you that you won't get. But guess what? It's not necessarily going to be in this life. Discipleship teach the saints that so they are contented with wherever they are. Amen. Let them understand that the world is going to hate you. The Bible says in 1 John 3 13, Marvel not, my brethren, if the world hate you. Here's the apostle writing that. Marvel not that the world hate you. And Jesus even did nicer in St. John 15 said, If the world hate you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. He said, If you were of the world, the world will love its own. But because you are not of the world, but I've chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Let them understand in the, the model of Jesus that once you become a disciple of Jesus Christ, you're going to have people who don't like you. So when they go to work and they experience some heartache and hard troubles, amen. And we're talking about discipleship program, you know, it might sound funny, but it's true. These are the things you can't cover up. You have to tell people as they are. Let them understand that once you become a child of God, there's going to be persecution. Verse 20 of the same St. John 15 says, Remember the word that I said unto you, or the word that I said unto you. The servant is not greater than his Lord. If they had persecuted me, they will also persecute you. And if I kept my saying, they will keep yours also. You know what scripture I like, 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 I like a lot? He say in Mark 10, 30, But ye shall receive an hundredfold now in this time. Houses and brethren and sisters and mothers and children and land, but it's going to say with persecution. So while God promised us that we're going to get some things, you're going to get it with persecution. So, you know, I always tell people if you're a child of God and your life is sealed, smooth and sealed, you probably need to check it out. Because Jesus tells us some things, and we need to tell the seals that once you live right, people are not going to like you. If everybody loves you, something wrong. It's all funny though, but it's true. Because everybody never loved Jesus. Based on how he taught, the disciples, them, the Pharisees, them seek a way to kill him. Because this man was just telling it as it is and living a life that was above that. So the first thing that the church needs to do, have a successful uh, discipleship program, is that it must model Jesus Christ. The second thing is that it must have a sound biblical teaching. Sound biblical teaching. That means the Bible itself gives us practical examples. And now we're going to a little bit more practical now of what we can do, amen, to ensure that we, we as a church, implement some things that are for discipleship purpose. So, for example, in the first example, the Bible says that Paul trained Timothy, who trained others to train others. That is 2 Timothy 2, verse 2. And the things which thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others 
also. So we realize that Paul is saying that he trained Timothy, what you have heard of me, now come to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. We see that example in the book of Acts chapter 18, amen, with Aquila and Priscilla, amen. And we know what happened, he says, and certain, praise God, and certain, a certain Jew named Apollos born in Alexandria, and an eloquent man, a mighty in scripture, came to Ephesus. This man was instructed in the way of the Lord, and being fervent in spirit, he spake and taught diligently the things of the Lord, knowing only the baptism of John. And he began to speak boldly in the synagogue, with whom Aquila and Priscilla had heard. They took him unto them and exposed unto him the way of God more privately. So we realize that there are biblical examples. Amen. Here's a man called Apollos. Here's a man who was mighty in, in terms of how he spoke. He was an eloquent man from Alexandria. Amen. He And he was now at Ephesus and preaching. And guess what? Guess what Apollos and Priscilla did. They realized that this man have a gift of preaching. They never said, boy, based on the fact that he's not preach the whole thing, they never, they never cut him down. They took him aside and they taught him the word more clearly explain him the way of God more perfectly. In other words, that's what we need to do. How do we do this? When we identify, how do we teach the word of God more perfectly to saints? We have programs in church that does that. New converts class. We spoke about that last year. New converts clear. Another thing is a Sunday school class. That's, that's discipleship. These are programs that are implemented. Bible study, you know, youth service, uh, one on one, amen. In terms of pastor talking to the saints, in terms of certain things, this is how you pass on and you expound of the word of God and you, and you bring people up to a level where they can know, uh, expound the word of God. I remember at age 16, I had a Sunday school teacher, 16 or 15, I had a Sunday school teacher. I don't know what she saw, but from I was about 14, 15, she was a teacher, but every now and then she would say to me, Go prepare to teach Sunday school. I remember the first time I taught Sunday school. I mean, I felt, and it was my, it was my age group. It was her class. It was about eight, 14, 15, 16. And she would call me and say, boy, you need to prepare to teach. And every now and then, and she did that with a couple of people. She would say, boy, because she identified the gifted in them. And when you make a mistake, she would call you aside and she would tell you, say, boy, you know, yeah, and you need to structure your thing. And you need to do this. And she would guide us along the way. That's what we call uh, discipleship. Not only was she teaching, but she was allowing us to teach. And when we make the mistake, she was right there to help us and to correct us and to guide us. Until now, amen, I see where, where that has helped. I tell Sister Kathleen Darlington all the time, we call her Sister Nursing. She was a, one of the best Sunday school teachers I've had because of how she had saw the gift and was able to pass that on. So that's the same principle. Um, she was able to, to teach me and then eventually I started to teach others, amen and to God be the glory. Example number two, we have um, where the older women are to train the younger women. Amen. That's also discipleship. So the Bible says in first, in Titus chapter two, three to five, the age woman likewise, that they should be in behavior as becoming holiness, not false accusers, not giving too much wine. So the older women must adorn themselves in a particular way. Teachers of good things, that they may teach the younger women to be sober, to love their husband, to love, uh, that's another part. You know, probably if we had some of these things as the scripture teaches, we would probably have less issues in the church. The older saints who have gone through some things understand what it takes and what is required. Amen. Should teach a younger woman, amen, how to be sober, to love their husband, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, keep us at home, good, obedient to their own husband and the word of God, so that the word of God be not blasphemed. Now, how do we establish this in the church? We have stuff like ladies auxiliary. Amen. That's a program that is used where uh, the women come in. I remember at our church, there are cases where we, where we have the women come and they will teach the young women how to sew or they teach them how to, to cook certain things or they will have little discussion and the young women who don't marry will ask the older one, them who are going on and how you go through that and they will tell them the whole thing about and they pass it on. So the older women pass it on to the younger women. And while the scripture is not talking about Men, the same principle applied to men. The men can, you have men's fellowship where the, we have program at Orchard where the men come in and they will talk about the one of them who have business, will teach a young one of them about business and starting business and how to keep them house and how to be good husband and them talk about the little issues that they have and the things they must look for 
um, when having a wife and how you treat women and all of these things, and your pass and all of these things, how fit, how fit, use a machine, how, whatever the simple things. But what they're doing is still discipleship. We are passing on the information from one to the other. And these are programs that the church can use, amen, to implement. And it's a sound biblical thing. As the Bible says there in, to the, in Titus, the age woman must teach a young woman. And it's a range of stuff here. And that's scripture. Then you have a uh, father should discipline their children and brethren should seek to be restored. So the Bible says, and you fathers provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Amen. Ephesians 6 verse 4 and verse Galatians 6 verse 1 says, brethren, if any man be overtaken with a fault, he will share spiritual to restore shall one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. Now, how will follow that in the church? You have what is called pastoral care and this and church discipline. It's a very important thing, you know. Uh, pastoral care, where the pastor himself now uh, have one on one with the saints and teach them. I, I had a relationship, amen, with, with Pastor Daly long before he was Pastor Daly, amen. I remember when he was Deacon Daly, amen. And I used to go to his house as a as a um young man, like 14, and I just got saved at age 12, and he had a, a big library. And he will tell you that I he would, he, I would talk with him, he would, he would carry out, he would do him whatever, I would just talk. I, you felt, you, you had the respect, but you learned so much. I learned so much from, from the people thinking it was practically like I'm a father. Well, probably why well, they didn't even know it because he's brown and me, you know. But I was there <laughs> around him all the time. I mean, pastoral care. Eventually, I've seen where the young people every Sunday uh, to this very day, now I'm older now, I'm not getting the invitations anymore. I need to talk to him about that. But I see the young people right now on a Sunday evening. Some of them, they pack up in the van and they've gone to him house and they have Sunday dinner. And when they have Sunday dinner, they him, him play, him talk with them and him, whatever. They've gone, whatever. They have that up to this very day. Every so the young men, young women, you have some time where the young women go and Sister Daly will deal with them. They have next year where the young men will go and they have that discussion. And every, I can tell you, almost every Sunday, the young men are at Pastor Daly's house. I don't know how him do it. I don't, he, he must reach. Amen. But at the end of the day, at the end of the day, it shows pastoral care. And I try to implement the same thing. I have I have some young men where um, every like every other month or so, I will go um as young men, we carry them go down the river. Amen. Them swim, I don't swim, I stay in the car. But at the same time, when, on the driving, them get to talk. Because it's something that, that was done to me, and I'm passing it on to them. So we, them get taught, them get to ask Bible questions, them get to ask where you got through as a minister. Do you ever fall? And you, and you be honest with them. You tell them the issues that you have too as a minister with with to an, to an extent. Amen. And you explain to them that, look here, nobody no perfect, but at the same time, we're all striving for God. And that's how you grow them up. But you're, not, you're a superman, but at the same time, you're a person who's trying to live for God. But at the same time, you have a thing called church discipline, which is also a part of discipleship. And the Bible tells us how, even as ministers, we should implement these things. Matthew 18, 5, 50 to 17, Jesus set forth a four-step process of what we call church discipline, which is a part of discipleship. What is that? If somebody sin in the church, and I like how Pastor Daly does it, if somebody sin, what he does, he calls them in talk with them. Amen. Nobody now to know, say, this brother commit fornication. The first time you commit fornication, the whole church bring him before the whole. Some person would have bring him before the whole church and embarrass them. No, that's not how it done. You call him aside, you sit with them, and you talk with them. That's the principle that the Bible put it. If in the war here, then you bring a witness. Then you tell it to the church, and then you treat him as an outsider. You know, it's the, the different step. The first step is that you tell him him sin alone. Virgin, I heard about this. I know that you're going through that. What is happening? And, and you get to talk with them. And that way, they have a newfound respect for you. Amen. In terms of a uh, biblical example, the Bible said, to exhortation ministry from saint to saint. Hebrews 3.13. But exhort one another daily while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened to the deceitfulness of sin. As every man had received the gift, even so minister the same one to another, as good stewards are the manifold grace of Jesus Christ. How is this in church this, um, discipleship? By allowing people to, to explore their own ministries that they have. Amen. So you have young people in the church who know how to exhort. Amen. You give them a chance every now and then to exhort or to do something. All right. You have people who can minister in the choir. You have people who can be who are good at different things. Amen. And they use that to minister to each other. Amen. But there's one aim of all of these programs put together. And the aim is 
to point the dis unsaved person to Christ, to help others to grow and become more mature in Christ, and to seek help from others so that they can continue to grow in Christ. So this is the, the based on the biblical example, all that we have read and I went through a while ago, there's a threefold purpose for that. One, we want to point unsaved people to Christ. Secondly, we want to help those that are already in church to grow and become more mature in Christ. And three, we ourselves must seek others so that we can continue to grow in Christ. I said it last week, if you are a saint and you don't have somebody who is uh, you are accountable to, it means that you are you are a walking bomb. Because at the end of the day, you must be accountable to somebody. A bishop is accountable to another bishop. You probably have a friend who reason with us, a brother, so on and so forth. The saints must be accountable to a saint, so on. And that's very important. So the first thing we spoke about was we must have a model that, that goes along with how Jesus implements it. Secondly, we can find biblical examples and we'll look at them and things that we can implement in the church to bring out these biblical examples. But lastly, the discipleship program that you have must cater to the whole man. Very, very important. So many of us hold the view that man is a, what we call a trichotomy or a tripartite, man, meaning every person we know is, is, is a composite of body, spirit, and soul. And that is based, and I will get that theology based on what Paul said to the church of Thessalonica. And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly, and I pray God your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved and preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. What am I saying? Is that while we are saved, one of the problems that some people have is that there is no program that fosters to the other side of them. In other words, I remember as and let, 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 let me jump into some scriptures first and then I'll tell you some stuff that, that I've gone through. Because we are tripartite that being as long as we are alive, God is also interested in our whole well-being. For example, Paul said to Timothy, bodily exercise profited little. Amen. So sometimes there are other little things that can be done, amen, outside of coming to church and just reading Bible and praying, 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 praying. You have other little things that can be done. Amen. That will help to foster fellowship in the body. Beloved, I wish above all that you may prosper and be in good health, even as your soul prosper. This is uh, uh, John writing to a guy called Gaius. Amen. And he was practically telling him that, look here, he wants his body to prosper also. In other words, they must foster to everybody. So why is this important? Fellowship is important because it helps to protect and preserve us and it helps us to grow. So he says, all word and no play makes for an unbalanced, unhealthy church. Now, let me tell you my example. I remember when I was, as a, as a young man, I remember we used to go to church. We learned some things as young men. One, and I can tell you, this is what Pastor Grizzle used to tell us to do. When you come to church, the first thing you do, find a place of prayer. So that has become a part of us. When you come to the house of God, before you talk to the body, before you go talk to the brethren and the saints, you find a place of prayer. So we learned that. All right. The second thing that he did is that because we never had nowhere else to go, we used to live practically live at church. So what he did, he bought a table tennis board. And what we usually do is to come by church. And sometimes we leave school and we are down there and we're playing table tennis. And while we're playing table tennis, a couple of stuff are happening. I'm discussing, I mean, Bible doctrine, somebody else, but we're having fun. I mean, sometimes I remember back in the day, we used to have, you have stuff like picnic. You have stuff like um um well church picnic where they have different different groups. So you have church competition. Uh, this is discipleship because guess what? If at the end of the day all you're just preaching is word 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 word, and people don't have any other outlet um, to to do stuff like have fun games because we are we are we are um people who are require fellowship require that type of thing. Amen. And praise God. And, and at the end of the day, in order to keep sometimes people in the house of God and keep young people and, and ensure that they grow also and mature, we have to cater to everything about them. We have to cater to their spiritual side, but we also have to cater to their spiritual side. I remember um, um, I was talking to Pastor Daly one time about a situation and I couldn't understand it. I said to him, sir, these young people are driving me nuts. And, 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 and he said, what do you mean? He said, but just can't understand them. The way they think about life, the way they reason is totally different. And he laughed. So I was saying, 
boy, so we, we laugh for saying, boy, every every generation have this. And so when he was growing up, he was doing the same thing. But he learned something and he was going to pass it on to me. So, okay, sir. And so, look, here, one of the things you have to do, if you're going to win these young people, you have to win them to yourself in a sense. So what he did, and it's something I tried to do, he said, for example, they come by his house and they play games. And while they're playing games, you know, and they, they, they whatever they're playing, instead of playing damage, whatever they're playing, um, he would have a discussion with them. So they might play and they might talk and they might have fun. But at the same time, while in that moment, he's passing on some spiritual values to them. So they, they might talk about what they do and they feel very comfortable and they're open to him. And when you have that type of openness and that type of relationship between you and them, then you're able to easily now impart things into them. I mean, you can talk about your experience as a child. Like you can talk about you growing up. I mean, and what you used to do and you used to pray. And you're passing these things on to them. I mean, you're, you're not just, I always tell you, you're not just um, trying to, to scale the fish. But you're trying to catch the fish first before you scale it. Pastor Grizzly used to do the same thing. He had some young people in his community. For example, Sister Daly, she was one of the young people who lived in his community as a little girl. And what he used to do with him, little van, him, him talk to the young people, him, him, them, them used to always see him van and run to him, and you know, think he was them father you know, in you know, the community. And what he did, he invite them come church, and on Sunday, the van pack up with peer young people. And today, Sister Daly, who was one of them, who was practically one of the young people who he saw, who used to be on the road and all that kind of stuff there, now is the pastor, our present pastor's wife. In other words, that's what you see. You win them, you bring them up, and you, you, you create, you, you know, those word, 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 but you build them to yourself. And then when you get them to yourself, you point them to God and you grow them up in God. Amen. So all word and no play makes for an unbalanced, unhealthy church. What is discipleship? Discipleship is threefold. Teaching them the model that Jesus taught, Showing them biblical examples of, of how it can be done. And I brought out some and also catering to the other side of them, which is their social side so that they can be able to open to you and you can point them to even more spiritual things. So tonight, we, we looked at three things. Who is a disciple? We define who that is. We say, what is discipleship? We, we look at the attacks that can come on a discipleship, and we look at what is required in any, scene, in any assembly for a discipleship program to be successful. I pray God that we have pulled something or something made sense for us tonight, and that at the end of the day, we can try to implement some of these things even over our lives, even in we as an individual discipling somebody else in the house of God that will try to implement some of these steps. Because wisdom, he that with it souls is wise. And winning souls don't mean just unsafe people, but winning souls, people in the house of God, even young people that are wayward, there is a wisdom in getting them to a place where they can conform and grow in grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. God bless you. God bless you in Jesus' name.